Good morning. Welcome, everyone. This uh, is the 26th edition of our Cities on the Frontline Speaker Series. My name is Francis Gesquier. I supervise the program of the World Bank in East Asia in the area of urban development and disaster risk management. Lauren is being held up by other responsibilities, so it is my pleasure to open the session today. And indeed, today we will talk about the concept of aging cities, a topic that is highly relevant in the context of COVID-19, if one considers the particular impact of the disease on the elderly, but also if one considers the demographic, demographic shift that is currently happening in many countries, many parts of the world, certainly in Japan, from where our three speakers, speakers originate today, but in fact, in many other parts of the world, including the US, Europe, and most of East Asia. Uh, if you remember from anything from today's session, I hope that it is that with a few tweaks and by being proactive, cities can actually uh, transform themselves and make sure that the elderly are continue to be active and con continue to be able to contribute to society rather than just being people that need to be assisted. In fact, there are huge opportunities for cities uh, two days now, we'll discover some of these today. So Ghani from GRCN, uh, in place of Lauren, will introduce our three speakers in a minute. But first, let me remind everyone of the intention of this speaker series and the ground rule for uh, today's conversation. First, the purpose of the speaker series is to have an open and honest learning uh, conversation. Uh, between practitioners and cities and government and partners uh, supporting these entities. The webinars are not on the record, and we ask that you not attribute any of the comments made today or questions asked to the speakers unless the material are made available after the call or you have the person's express permission to do so. We have close to 300 participants or people registered uh, for the call today. So to facilitate the discussion, we ask that you use the Q&A function on the WebEx platform to pose your question. And yes, uh, note that the recording of this session as well as, uh, as, well as the PowerPoint presentation will be post posted online next Monday. So you'll get access to all of the material presented today. So Rap, over to you to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Francis. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Um, I work in GRCN in the capacity of Associate Director based in Singapore office. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce the three distinguished speakers uh, today. Yeah, I think the breadth of the experience we have today in the panel is something uh, which, which, um, which uh, is quite uh, um, uh, good and, and it's, an, it's an opportunity and, and uh, for the aging cities and the agenda you will hear from. Our first speaker is Ms. Yuko, who is an urban specialist at the World Bank Group and based out of Singapore office, she works on urban development projects in East Asia region. We are happy to uh, have her uh, to start. Um, following her, I have I have an, a complete honor knowing and working with the the next two speakers. Our second speaker is Miss Mr. Hiroyuki Fujita-san, who was the former vice mayor of Kyoto City Council and currently the chief resilience officer and acting as a director of Kyoto City International uh, Community House. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Fujita-san. Our last speaker is Dr. Uh, Joseph Ronzo Inada-san, who is uh, Toyama City Council's Chief Resilience Officer and Head the Office of Strategic Planning and Resilience at Toyama City. In his previous capacity, he was also the Senior Policy Advisor to the Mayor's Office of Toyama City Council. 
I have a um, pleasure in welcoming all of these speakers, uh, and I will um, look forward uh, to a great Q&A session. I don't want to hold more, and I will hand it over to uh, Ms. Yuko to start with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank and Sarah. Uh, let me share my screen now. Sarah, can you tell me when it's there? Uh, it's, uh, it's there, Yuko. You just uh, make it slideshow and you will be able to stop. Yeah, correct. Wonderful. All right. Um, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuko Rai, and I'm pleased to be here with all of you uh, to discuss aging cities in the quarantine context and how we can enhance age readiness of our cities. So COVID-19 is the first time that comes since the world's population consisted of more age over 65 than under five. And, and this is a, a really significant uh, reality that we are facing today. Um, WHO reports that over 95% of COVID-related deaths in Europe occurred in people older than 60 years, but it also reports that it was over 80 years of age is five times the global average. Uh, And here in Japan, about 20% of the infected people are age 70 and older, and 83% of the deaths are, in fact, in this age group. So given that COVID fatality rises sharply with age, the value of social distancing will increase in the aging society, and this will have important consequences of how the pandemic spread, what the city's economic response rate. And the aging trend would only uh, continue and exacerbate. So UN estimates that one six will be over 65 years globally by 2015. But while mortality rate of COVID increases with age, it's not just chronological age that matters. Uh, that is, that's not only the main problem, but it's really the associated increase in the underlying health conditions, such as health disease or cancer, diabetes, et cetera. Uh, UN reports that in estimated 56% of the people aged over 70 or at least one underlying condition, uh, and, and this places them at increased risk of a severe impact of COVID-19. So in a nutshell, healthy aging matters, and active seniors are increasing worldwide. So there are four points that I'd like to highlight. So the first point is on the higher exposures to clusters of infection. So, in fact, uh, residential aged care facilities uh, remain a particular vulnerable setting for COVID transmission. So, globally, only a small share uh, of the elderly lives in nursing homes with the kind of the round-the-clock round care. But people living in this institutional model have been particularly affected by COVID because of their greater susceptibility to the illnesses or the contagion risks in such shared spaces. So, we found that these facilities have difficulties in and keeping social distancing and also creating confined spaces uh, for those who are affected that each, each room is shared and contains several residents. Uh, COVID-19 is anticipated to adversely affect aged care facilities, especially in the view of chronic shortage of, of the care workers. Uh, the second point I'd like to raise is the limited accessibility uh, aspect. So there are increased challenges brought about by the requirements to spend more time at home so, for instance, in, there is increased difficulty to access uh, various services and also destinations, and there's also less visits of medical workers uh, to help the elderly. And then the third point is that there is even more limited social interaction than the usual. So social distancing, as we all know, is, is crucial in dealing with COVID, but this can actually compound the social isolation that many of the elderly already face. So, for instance, they lack physical contact with other families the members of friends, colleagues, and they experience anxiety and fear of illness and death as well. So yes, social distancing is important, but this would need to be accommodated by social support measures and also targeted care for the elderly, uh, including by increasing their access to various digital technolo technologies. Um, so we need to think of how we design uh, urban spaces uh, for safe interaction and not social isolation. 
The last point I'd like to highlight is the economic well-being of the elderly. So while the pandemic may significantly lower incomes or the living standards of the elderly uh, due to either temporary cessation of employment or permanent unemployment, the so UN reports that already less than 20% of those at retirement age are receiving a pension, and they are less likely to be reemployed uh, compared to younger people with the same ability. And actually, there are some that research and anecdotal evidence exists on possible age discrimination on decisions on medical care, a triage, and therapy due to their perceived limited roles in society and longer uh, periods that is required for recovery, and also fewer years of life expectancy. But is this all tr true? So I think we need to ensure that difficult health care decisions affecting the older people are guided by a commitment to dignity and the right to health. And, but what's more important is that the effort to protect the elderly should not look, overlook the many variations of the elderly in this category and all the all roles that they have in society as productive members uh, of the community. And it's hard here is that we need to understand the full diversity of people in the elderly, quote unquote, elderly category. And their needs are actually as the people, uh, as the younger people in the COVID context. Uh, the gender aspect I'd also like to highlight, so the role of informal caregivers uh, who are often women, uh, and it's important to uh, um, ensure their safety and security, uh, and this is addressed as well in pandemic responses. Uh, so the in, also the increased risk of caregivers um, who are often female must also be given full attention. Uh, so actually, um, the elderly in the developing countries, uh, many of the world declining countries are being hit far harder uh, than the charts in, in the richer countries, would say, and they have insufficient health systems. Systems, uh, underdeveloped infrastructure, and also lower levels of social income, weaker social protection systems. Uh, however, we have found that developing countries around the world have made efforts to initiate a variety of responses. Um, some of the uh, key examples that we found, for instance, in Argentina, are uh, cases where chapels are repurposed as emergency shelters for the elderly. And in Mexico, uh, an network of professionals were convened by the city to do daily uh, check-ins uh, with the elderly who are living alone and also delivering food and medicine to them. And finally, in India, uh, there are uh, examples of where health uh, workers supported people with special needs and also the elderly living alone. And there were uh, many phone calls uh, made to, to the personnel. So what have we done pandemic, especially looking at the nexus of aging COVID? So first, I think, um, as we all experience, the city of lockdowns uh, has actually allowed us to experience how it's like to be old and alone. And I think it allowed us to realize what kind of additional services uh, we need to have. Because obviously, if you're alone in a house, you will not have the mobility or the access that you have before. And it can actually uh, be a trigger for further technological innovation. And the private sector could also find a whole new market that they haven't fully tapped into yet. And uh, another point on the, te uh, the note uh, on technology. So technology can, can help. And we've seen uh, many examples of, for instance, in China, how telemedicine has taken off during the crisis. And this has become a useful option, and not for the elderly, uh, but for the society at large. So COVID recovery is an opportunity uh, to set the stage for a more inclusive, equitable, and age-related society. And this needs to be anchored in human rights and also guided by uh, the shared promise of leaving no one behind. And in a nutshell, um, enhancing age readiness in cities, uh, I think, will become more relevant than ever in the post-COVID world. Uh, number one, because there's really little guesswork with aging. Um, it's you know, we know exactly where uh, and when, and also how aging will happen and to what extent. So there's really no reason to overlook aging uh, in developing planning, especially uh, at the early stages. Thinking ahead is far more cost effective than the reactive responses down the road. So um, I'd like to add by uh, touching a bit upon uh, the global study that we have initiated. 
So the world has recognized the agenda to build adaptive, productive, and inclusive cities for the aged, uh, focusing on the built environment, uh, which takes primarily a spatial dimension. And this is actually a, what, one where we have found that there is a gap in research and application. So in other words, uh, the efforts of the World Bank has been primarily focused on social care, health protection systems, but what can we do in the built environment? And this has, has not been explored um, as, as much as it needed. And since last year, we have been implementing a global study on enhancing age readiness in cities uh, with select case studies from around the world. Uh, so we'll be launching more um, engagement events on the study and support as we move towards completion on early next calendar year. So please um, stay tuned. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, hi. So, uh, hello everyone. Good evening and good morning and good afternoon. My name is Hiroyuki Fujita and Chief Resilience Officer of Kyoto City. Uh, today, I would like to thank you for inviting me to the Global Resilience City Network and uh, for giving an opportunity to report mainly the response to the COVID-19 of Kyoto. Uh, so, uh, by the way, the theme of this session is aging cities, uh, but Kyoto has been the capital of Japan for more than 1,000 years, and during that time, the function of the city has continued without interruption. Of course, in the meantime, Kyoto had a lot of crises, including repeated earthquakes, a big fires, wars, and uh, epidemics. Uh, however, like the phoenix, uh, like this picture, uh, Kyoto has overcome each crisis and has been revived. So you can call Kyoto a resilient city. Next slide, please. So uh, let me first introduce Kyoto overview simply. Uh, as I said before, Kyoto is an old city that flourished as the capital of Japan from the end of the 8th century. As a result, the various cultures, arts, and traditions have been accumulated. At the same time, Kyoto has developed as an environmentally advanced city, which issues the Kyoto Protocol. As a base uh, city for spiritual culture, uh, the National Agency uh, for Cultural Affairs will be relocated to Kyoto, to Kyoto year after next. As a manufacturing city, it fuels traditional and advanced industries. And as an autonomous city, that the local community is still active. Moreover, it is a university city where university students make up 10% of the total population. Next slide, please. Uh, fortunately, the result of avoiding a large-scale air raid in the Second World War, uh, a lot of cultural properties uh, have been preserved. So Kyoto has uh, 16, uh, sorry, 17 World Heritage Sites, for example, Kinkaguchi Temple, Kiyomizu Temple, Nijo Castle, within a radius of 50, 15 kilometers in the city center. In addition, Kyoto is also a tourism city that uh, represents Japan, uh, which is best uh, blessed with historical heritage and rich nature. And many tourists from home and abroad visit Kyoto uh, to enjoy various festivals, traditions, entertainment, culture, and religion. Next, please. Next slide, please. On the other hand, the situation that declining birth rates and the aging population progressing at the same time is one of the most serious crises in Japan, including Kyoto. Even if in the forecast of the national government, the proportion of population aged 65 and over will exceed 
30% of the total population by 2025. And in the last several years, the total population has been clearly decreasing already, and the urban population is also declining in all cities, including, including Kyoto, except Tokyo. And however, declining birth rate and aging population are becoming a common issue in developed countries. In that sense, it can be said that Japan is ahead of the task of declining and aging population. Actually, the resilience strategy of Kyoto City was also established based on such situations. That is, with the perspective of how to stop the population decline, even if the population declining is inevitable, we aimed to maintain and develop the rich charm of Kyoto's wonderful traditions in landscape, culture, and art together with all seasons. Next slide, please. Now, uh, so let's get into the main subject. Uh, this table uh, you are viewing shows the number of people infected with COVID-19 and the number of users of Kyoto Station, which is one of the Kyoto, one of Kyoto's representative transportation hubs from the middle of March to the middle of August. Uh, it can be seen that more than six, 600,000 users of Kyoto stations per day, uh, not in this table, uh, actually uh, 1 million users at maximum, uh, but remain below 200,000 during the period of the emergency, the emergency declaration. At the same time, reducing the number of infected people with time lag of 10 days or two, two weeks, there was an apparent effect that the number decreased sharply. On the contrary, it is clear that after the emergency declaration was released, the number of station users increased and the number of infected people also increased. However, the fact uh, the, that the number of users is, is decreasing means that the number of tourists and shoppers are decreasing sharply. The economic impact has already increased as, ma as many commercial facilities, such as shops and restaurants, had, be, uh, had to be closed. Uh, by the way, in COVID-19, the infection rate to the elderly was high at first, and the number of decreased uh, diseases was increasing. After that, however, more people were infected among the younger generation. Infections to the elderly have not increased significantly, and there are less cases of severe diseases compared to the initial stage of infection. It seems that it was successful that uh, the elderly themselves refrained from going out and at the same time, in Japan, remarkably fulfilling of medical welfare for the elderly contributes uh, to longevity. Next slide, please. Uh, the tourism, um, uh, uh, as for the tourism, uh, however, the tourism industry was most, most affected by COVID-19 infection. In Kyoto, the number of tourists, uh, which has exceeded uh, 53 million a year, has decreased significantly. In particular, in particular the number of overseas tourists staying 320,000 per month last year decreases to less than two, only 200 in May. Uh, as a result, tourism of Kyoto has decreased by 99% and extremely terribly affected. Next slide, please. And uh, with that, the cultural art uh, that represents Kyoto, Kyoto's charm has been hit uh, hard by the COVID-19. Support for uh, the people engaging culture and art was 
started with the maximum use of national support systems and subsidies, uh, subsidies and together the uh, cooperation of citizens. At the same time, it has also affected the activities of local community that is one of, the Kyoto, one of Kyoto's greatest strengths in building the resilience of Kyoto city. Community activities are extremely important in preparing for disasters and supporting the safety of citizens, but there are concerns about the negative effects such as, such as inability to volunteer activities due to COVID-19 infection. Therefore, uh, we pre prepare the manual to perform uh, local activities while preventing infection. And we, were, we are promoting efforts to support the interaction of ICT tools in local community activities. And we established the support fund uh, by collecting the donations from citizens and companies to support medical institutions, healthcare workers, the elderly, people with disabilities and child rearing families. In the short term, nearly $2 million were collected. Next slide, please. So uh, the theme of this session is uh, titled Aging Cities, but uh, never forget that each old city has its history and has experiences of overcoming various crises. It would be important to respect for nature, value, culture, and art, and maintain the values that people cooperate with each other. That a lifestyle that prioritizes this only economic growth and convenience. In that background, we are trying to show the world our new model of a city that is both disaster resilient and environmentally friendly. At the same time, SDGs, or the Sustainable Development Goals, appeared as a very important and close idea. So in Kyoto, we are working to build resilience and promote SDGs as two wheels of the car. Thinking from that perspective, what is important is responding to COVID-19 should be to overcome inequality and discrimination more than fighting against the virus itself. Uh, today, uh, it, is, uh, it should be uh, required that uh, citizens uh, work together to realize the sustainable society where no one is left behind even if, even when in the face of various risks, such as infection diseases. In other words, I believe that the city could be sustainable because it contains such a philosophy. Finally, and while working closely with many participating cities and companies to Global Legend Cities Network, including the World Bank, we would like to continue our efforts to further improve the resilience of Kyoto through responding to uh, COVID-19. Thank you for your attention. Joseph, I believe you're still on mute. And Mr. Fujita, if you could uh, mute, that would be great. 
Joseph, if you move your mouse, you should find how to unmute. Yes. I know, but it, it seems to not want to go off mute. I don't know why. There you are. It works now. Oh, am I on? Yes. Really? Yes. Yes, you are. Here. Okay, great. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Runso Inada. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer of the City of Toyama in Japan, and this first picture just gives you an idea of the city. We're on the Sea of Japan, and we're right under the crest of the Northern Japan Alps. The city has a huge area of 1,242 square kilometers, and that will figure into what I say. Uh, Toyama, like Japan, faces extreme population aging, making it highly susceptible to diseases which especially affect the elderly. As this graph indicates, by 2060, 38% of Japan's population will be 65 or older. Toyama will fare slightly better uh, with about 36.6% of the population 65 or older. Joseph, I, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't oh. want to interrupt, but I, I don't think you're sharing your slides. We don't see mm. uh, any of them. Sorry. So if you can go to the bottom of your screen and go to the share content. Yeah, 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 yeah. I clicked it earlier. There it's coming. Oh, okay. I don't know why it didn't go on. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Should I start from the beginning? Probably. <laughs> okay. It's still uh, still loading, but it'll be there in a minute. In a minute. Yeah, it loads you... fully. Are we on? Not yet. I probably tried to turn it on too quickly. We'll, we'll give it another 10 seconds and otherwise. Stop. Oh, there it is. Stop. OK. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, everyone, for the technological glitch. My name is Joseph Ranzuinata. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer of the City of Toyama, Japan. And uh, I just said, but what you're looking at is a uh, picture of the city. It's on the Sea of Japan, and it's tucked right under the crest of the Northern Japan Alps. The city has 1,242 square kilometers of land. So it's a very large area and figures into what I will say. Uh, this graph shows you the population. Um, whoops. Shows you the population um, in uh, po the aging population of uh, Japan, uh, by the year uh, 2060, about 38% of the population will be 65 or older. Toyama is going to fare slightly better with a 36.6% population of 65 or older. The next slide shows you the um, disproportionate COVID-19 death rate for the elderly in Japan. Um, because there are so many older people, the death rate is especially high with the over 80 group. Toyama's success in combating COVID-19 is rooted in its long-term resilience strategy. Under the auspices of the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities Program, we developed a resilience strategy for 2050. At the heart of this strategy is a focus on the resilience of people in a, and I quote, mutually supportive community for all generations, where we support our seniors to live active lives, and they support younger people with families, while youth supports our seniors, all to strengthen social bonds. This snapshot of our resilience city, one item, which is our um, citizen health, well-being, and participation initiative for 2050, uh, explicitly says two things. One, that everyday mutual support with each other brings us, quote, better prepared to offer support during emergency situations, and two, connects an active lifestyle for the older generation with the seniors improved resistance to disease. This is a map showing the population distribution in Toyama, where the darker the red, the higher the concentration of the elderly. And as you can see, the elderly are primarily located along the transportation lines uh, within the city. Our compact city plan um, is an attempt to deal with um, the spread out nature of the city, as well as helping the elderly. And our first goal was to revitalize public transportation and to help move 
citizens and also city facilities into the transportation lines. The result of the strategy is to connect our 1,242 square kilometers of urban, suburban, and rural citizens with the city facilities. We upgraded facilities and we uh, were able to encourage a senior active lifestyle. For example, our LRT system has barrier-free access. We have personal attendance on the cars to help the elderly, and we've changed the way the LRT cars operate from the usual Japanese system, so there's easy um, entrance and exit for the elderly. We have a couple of programs that I'll just mention uh, aimed towards the elderly. One is a smart card, which uh, for a very small fee lets them use any transportation system anywhere in the city. And another is a program where if you're a grandparent and you take a grandchild or someone even aged as a grandchild to any city facility like a museum, uh, you're allowed to go in free. We've also built um, medical, uh, specialized medical facilities for the elderly along the transport lines. One of these is the Katakawa Center, which is built to increase elder mobility. It was built on repurposed land from a uh, disused elementary school because we have a declining population of elementary students. And this uses natural hot spring water, first in Japan, for aquakinetics and um, other therapies. A second kind of medical facility is uh, right in the downtown. Um, this facility provides in-house care with doctors going to houses and also helps senior citizens uh, work out their medical plans. But around the facility, we have a nursing school, gymnasium, and sports club. So the whole center is directed towards an active lifestyle. And you'll see in the lower right, we even ordered special cars from Toyota, uh, which are very small that a nurse can uh, climb into, throw her medical bag in the back, and go down narrow streets and actually legally double park and um, help senior citizens. The, the upshot of all of this, the transportation system and the facilities, is to provide a network of support services for senior citizens throughout the city. And a lot of this has to do with access. And you remember from our first speaker, uh, Yuko's comments, that access is one of the most important things for the elderly. Now, this next slide shows you comparative cases of um, COVID-19 across the world. Japan, of course, has a very low number in this particular chart. It's at the bottom. So how is that possible? The next chart, uh, next uh, slide shows you the national measures which were taken in Japan. Uh, do remote business, uh, three-month school closure, wear face masks, keep social distance, wash hands, typical things. In Japan, uh, the government is not allowed to demand or require things. It can only suggest. But in Japan, most people voluntarily follow these rules, so there was widespread uh, following of the rules. Additional measures that Toyama took early on were economic assistance, households with children and single family parents, small businesses, discounts for hotels to help with um, their business, and also reduced uh, or delayed taxes. Now, these two charts are interesting. The upper left shows you the two waves of COVID cases in Japan, first uh, peaking around April and the second peaking around August. The lower right hand shows you the two waves in Toyama. Now, in Japan as a whole, and I noticed in Kyoto as a whole, the second wave was the largest wave. In Toyama, it's the reverse. The first wave was the highest, with about 20 cases a day on, in April. And the second wave in August was about half as high. So the question is, how did Toyama successfully bring this about? And one of the reasons is the underlying strategic plan for resilience, which we had in place for 10 years. Uh, one way to see uh, some of the differences is to look at two cases of nursing homes. I'm an American, uh, but I live in Japan and work in Japan. So comparing nursing homes in Japan and the United States, Japan has about 126 million uh, citizens. The United States has 328. There are about a million people living in Japanese nursing homes and about 1.2 million living in Amer uh, nursing homes in the United States. But remarkably, only 14% of Japan's COVID-19 deaths, or about 172, occurred in nursing homes. Whereas in the United States, 40% of the deaths out of 180,000 
occurred in nursing homes, which is 72,000 deaths. So the death rate was far greater in the United States in nursing homes. What might be the reason? Well, one thing to look at is there was a Business Insider report in August, and it looked at 220 U.S. nursing homes which had been cited for violations, and the violations were lack of hygiene and infection control, unmet medical and nutritional needs, and neglect. Now, I have a, uh, my mother, who is no longer living, was in an American nursing home, and my uh, mother-in-law, who's now living, is in a Japanese nursing home. And I can say from my personal experience that the very rigorous testing that Japanese nursing homes have would prevent most of the kinds of problems that seem to have shown up in the American nursing homes. Uh, what kinds of things is Toyama doing for the future? One is encouraging contact contract contact, sorry, tracing through cell phones. Uh, currently in Japan, the system has about 8 million users. It's fairly new. Uh, but also there are four kinds of things that the city's doing to get ready for a third wave. The first is to increase the number of PCR testing sites. Right now we have 110 clinics and hospitals in the city that can do this. We want to increase the number of designated hospitals for treating COVID-19 because people are assigned to a hospital once it's discovered they have COVID-19. We want to increase the number of hospital beds where actually they've been decreasing because of the decrease in population, and we want to increase the number of ventilators. Finally, I'm going to end by saying um, a lot of technological things are important and some of the other uh, programs, but I would say these are the most important lessons for social and health uh, resilience. The first is advanced preparedness. The second is an integrated and comprehensive approach not a single barrel approach, as it were. The third is promoting a healthy lifestyle. And this was also in um, Yuko's presentation, as I recall. It's very important to ahead of time have this healthy lifestyle, especially for the elderly. Uh, fourth is a rapid response. Uh, we have very quick turnaround in the tests and consistently apply the strategy. So the city of Toyama stayed consistent when the second wave came and reduced the second wave. And I would say the most important single thing is a communal spirit and other caring social perspective that underlies all of your programs and makes them effective. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Yes, very interesting. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Yuko. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fujita. I think these were three really interesting uh, presentation. As always, we have uh, a lot of questions. It'll be difficult to uh, to use them all or to to choose among them. But I, I would like to start with one question to you, Mr. Fujita, talking about uh, the new Kyoto model for tourism, art, and cultural activities, as well as local community activities, which is rely a lot on on technology and ICT. Uh, and we know that ICT is a huge challenge for the elderly population. It's very difficult for them to, uh, to, 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 to use, to learn these new technologies. And so is there anything the city has done to prepare them for this challenge, to facilitate uh, their, their use of this technology? And linked to this, then I, after you speak, uh, Mr. Fujita, I'd like to turn to Yuko. Yuko, at the end of your presentation, you you had a slide showing the broad framework that the World Bank is, is trying to uh, organize on what cities can do to better support an aging population. Can you build on this, give us a, a few tangible examples of, of what cities can do? And then finally, we'll move to, to Joseph. I'm sure you've already given interesting example, but I'm sure you'll have more. So if we can do this sequencing, uh, Mr. Fujita specifically, on, on the use of technology uh, in Kyoto, and then Yuko a bit more broadly, and then to you, Joseph. So over to you, uh, Mr. Fujita. And uh, yeah, please unmute before you speak. If you move your mouse, you will see the little microphone appear in red. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, important question, Francis. 
the number of people engaged in various fields in becoming insufficient and aged by aging population. Uh, utilization of ICT is essential in the sense of making up for the lack of such people. At the same time, uh, it is important for the elderly to be involved in various activities of society to keep their good health and their quality of life. Uh, utilization of ICT, including the internet, uh, should be effective means for the elderly themselves. themselves. Uh, in response to COVID-19, information uh, transmission by video and the internet uh, has become more active in the fields of tourism and culture and arts. Also, ICT is used for various information transmission in the activities to local communities. Uh, but uh, at that moment, uh, frankly, uh, it's still a difficult situation for elderly for the elderly to full uh, utilize ICT. In, in that sense, although the remarkable progress of ICT uh, these days should be uh, evalu evalu uh, evaluated, it is necessary to develop equipment and devices that are easy for the elderly, including me, and to use. Uh, to use. Uh, I think that is an important issue for the future. Therefore, in Kyoto City, uh, Kyoto uh, Municipal Institute of the, uh, Industrial Technology and Center uh, has been established to cooperate with leading companies and provide inter entrepreneur support. And while promoting collaboration, collaboration and cooperation with universities, and companies. Uh, also, we opened some lecture courses for the elderly to adopt ICT tools started from this month. And we began to create a manual for using ICT tools, which is easy to the elderly to understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fujita. Yuko, you want to elaborate on and go beyond just technology? Sure, um, yeah, so, I, so going back to um, the framework uh, that we are developing and some of the early findings and maybe some of the tangible actions, I see um, a question in the chat box asking about what things we can do um, in, in urban. Um, I guess I'd like to first start by saying that there are multiple um, entry points uh, to enhancing age readiness and, you know, they can be, you can start small, and uh, one of the case studies that we've um, done is on Slovakia, and they're quite I mean, extremely early uh, in looking at the aging agenda, especially from the built environment perspective. But interestingly, universal accessibility has been very much mainstream, at least in Bratislava, um, to enhance urban design of infrastructure and architecture. And if we dig down into like why that was the case, it seems that the conformity to EU codes has actually allowed for universal accessibility to take off. And that was their first step on the age readiness. So it wasn't really about aging, it was about something else. But actually it ended up being, you know, um, uh, creating age readiness um, for, for the city. So I think that was a, a takeaway for me that, you know, you don't have to necessarily label it um, age-ready cities, and I think this will be important to think about in, you know, countries where resources are poor and you don't, you know, when you have like 500 other policy priorities, you could still plan for cities um, that are age-friendly uh, without, you know, having, looking at other um, public, important policy agendas. Um, the second point I guess I would like to make is, um, so going back to Jokta's uh, presentation on the Compact City strategy in Toyama, I think um, I'd like to reinforce Joseph's point that compact cities in Toyama is really not about managing urban sprawl or managing urban expansion, as is the case for most uh, countries in the world, but it's actually about how to optimize infrastructure locations in an Asian city context or shrinking city context. So it's about bringing back the elders to the city center, um, easier access to jobs, community centers, 
and it's also about the O and M cost um, because there will be less tax years um, and the working population is uh, shrinking. So, what I guess what I'm trying to say here is that um, so Japan has a history of accommodating urban growth by expanding, uh, and that, that there's an affordability perspective to that as well because you know not everybody could afford to live in city centers. But then I think it's important to think what happens 50 years down the line, you know, when there's a demographic shift as we've seen in Toyama and changing the way we plan cities, envisaging this shift, it's really, it's in a critical lens um, for spatial planning and also capital investment planning for age ready cities. And I think the cities in the developing world um, need to think about these um, efforts that are, you know, difficult and costly to, to reverse a very short point um, on and some interesting findings actually that came through this morning uh, from the Korea case study. So um, we did a spatial analysis of locations of where the elderly live and tracing their daytime and nighttime activity. And what was really interesting to me was that there is limited daytime activity of the elderly around senior citizen centers and neighborhoods that have a high concentration of the elderly. And I was quite surprised that in fact we have found evidence that there is a tendency for the elderly to prefer to be at destinations where there is a high access rate by the younger generation. So it means that the elderly don't actually prefer to be with their other fellow, fellow uh, elderly you know, um, citizens, but actually they want, you know, to, uh, mixing with you know, so in the intergenerational perspective. I think this has an implication of how we plan public spaces and services that they should be intergenerational in nature and not elderly specific. So um, this was a huge takeaway um, for me. And actually, this is a trend not only seen for Korea, but this appeared to be true for most country case studies that we've conducted. So this has um, given me, uh, us a lot of food for thought of, of planning um, urban uh, design and for, uh, facilities and, and design. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Yuko. Uh, Joseph. All yours, and in fact, there is a, a specific question for you on on the Kadokawa care centers that you mentioned, and someone uh -huh. is asking. Phil Carp is asking, has this center continued to be operational yes. uh, during during the lockdown and during the the, the crisis? Hi, Phil. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it had reduced um, time for well. Okay, if you look at the, the graph of the uh, coronavirus in Toyama, there was a outbreak, and then we had 65 days of no virus. I'm sorry, can you hear me? We okay? Okay. We can see 65 days of no virus, and another outbreak, and then we have another, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, valley, a valley in, in the system. Anyway, um, once we pretty much overcame that first outbreak, things reopen, not everything. You can go to a gym, you have to be very careful. In the same thing that uh, Katakawa Center I mentioned, you can go there. I should mention that that center isn't just a place to go and do exercise. They actually have doctors and nurses there that assess every single person who comes, elder person. You have to be an older person to use it. They assess every person, they assess their body type, body needs, age, the way they can be helped the most. And so they would be utterly aware of whether the person is susceptible to the virus, has or hasn't got the virus, and so on. So yes, it was limited in its opening, but it was open just like we had gymnasiums that were open, but not during the peak where we had all the schools closed and all the gymnasiums closed and so on. Now, can I also mention something about Yuko's comment? Yep. Yeah, Yuko's comment entirely accords with what Toyama's vision is. Toyama's rather famous for this compact city idea, it doesn't mean everybody goes to the center of the city. It actually means moving people along transportation corridors. So it's still spread out, but it's concentrating, especially the elder. It is aimed a lot at the elder population, closer to the needs they have in medical facilities or even just meeting, as she was mentioning, younger people. So Toyama has 2,400 parks, huge number of parks. But if you can't get the older person to come to the park, it doesn't do any good to have all those parks. So the, 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 base, the baseline is you have to have connectivity. How do you get connectivity? One way is transportation. Now, we can talk about IT and so on solutions, but for elder people, those are not necessarily the easiest solutions for them. I think Mr. Fujita mentioned this. 
But for the elder person, a lot of what they need really is just physical accessibility, ability to get around, ability to be active, ability to be healthy. So the city concentrated, it's not the city ignored ICT, but the city concentrated on the ability of people to physically connect with each other. And I think that's a lot of why the city's resilient, has been very resilient in the face of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. I, I think I, I, it's a, maybe uh, towards the end of it, uh, we, we are coming towards the end of it, but just one question maybe specifically uh, to, to Yuko, where, where we, are, we are talking about the examples in, in most in the developed parts of Asia, Korea, Japan, we, we heard uh, specifically from, uh, from both Fujita-san and, and, and Joseph on those examples. But how do you imagine aging of cities um, in, in emerging Asia? And do you have, other than those examples that you mentioned, are, are, are there any, any Asian examples specifically uh, which, which you have come across while working, working in this region? Uh, yes, um, yeah, thanks a lot for that question. I actually like to add a little bit. Um, so in fact, there are a lot of um, Asian examples uh, but we've not only been looking at, at the, so since I talked a lot about Japan and Singapore and all these, um, Korea, you know, these countries, um, I'd like to also touch upon a little bit about what is uh, being done in developing countries, primarily, you know, World Bank client countries. Uh, and these are, you know, countries where resources are much poorer and, and, and it's really difficult how you make a case uh, on the importance of um, aging of, of these countries. And I, I guess, um, so one of the things, um, so there's an IDA 19 priority. Uh, so IDA is for countries um, that uh, are the most poor in the, in the world. And, and disability ha is a major priority um, for uh, the Africa region. And we have made a commitment to um, pay more attention on the disability agenda for Africa. So I think one of the things that we've been looking at in some of the cases in things done in, in Africa is that it's important to realize that there's disproportionately higher rates of disability among the elderly and disability is, is an agenda that kind of appeals to the region. So what we've been having, um, what we've been looking at is that uh, some of the things done for the dis disabled in Africa can actually be useful uh, interventions for the elderly and that's, I think that's what we've been doing for the, the other regions as well. So obviously, we're you know all that we're talking about today is on enhancing age readiness in cities, but but you know there are other cohorts of the society that can benefit um, as much as um, the elderly. Thank you, thank you, Yuko. I think we we are coming um, right towards the end of the session, um, and and Francis, I will, I will conclude if we don't have any. Further questions or any, any further additions? Uh, there, there are that? dozens of questions, but I think we we're gonna have to close. Yeah, I would encourage people to. Uh, I, I think when there's a lot of materials from WHO, from UN Habitat, there will be soon uh, some interesting material from the World Bank, and I'll encourage you to look at it and to think about this topic not just as elderly population or population that need to be taken care of, but as an opportunity to have a whole part of our population to remain active and contributing uh, to society. And I think uh, there, there's, there are huge opportunities uh, and not just the elderly will benefit uh, from, from those, uh, from actions in, in those directions. So, Sarab, I'll let you close, but I think I want to thank the, the various speakers. I think these were very interesting insights on the topic. All yours, Sarab. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, I, as we close, I think thank you. Thank you, Fujita san. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. So I'm a, I think I'm a, I'm a personal fan of Toyama's compact city plan, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that Joseph or his team, will, if you reach out to them, we will be happy to share some more examples on this material. Um, the new Kyoto city model is also something which is which I will be personally looking forward to, uh, and how how that activates uh, a, a city which has been there for a thousand years and hopefully will remain for another thousand. Um, I think uh, Yuko, uh, on on your point, 
So I think the, I, I, it's maybe the challenge of how the aging of cities impacts the urban poor and maybe the more emerging uh, emerging Asia or frontier uh, Asia or frontier markets in general. And I think that's something which as, as we go ahead, will I won't say that we don't have solutions, but something as a challenge and Japan can certainly lead us the way for the world as they're aging first. Uh, but what, what the Japanese cities do so will be looked by the Europeans, by the Americans, and, and then later on uh, by the Asian cities. Uh, with that, I think I will just uh, mention that our next uh, 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 session will be hosted in uh, two weeks' time. The topic of uh, the next week, uh, ne the coming session in a couple of weeks, will be predicting. Uh, uh, Predicting and monitoring infection. Uh, we are still confirming the speakers for the session, so the registrations will, will be shared along with the speaker's name uh, shortly via our channels. And we hope uh, that we get the same uh, same participation as we have for this session and have been having uh, for last 26 sessions. Thank you. Thank you for Jitasan again. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Yuko. It's been lovely uh, uh, this session, and I enjoyed uh, doing uh, moderation and stepping into Lauren's shoes as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, good night, wherever you are.